Hello, everyone. Can you hear me, Richard? Oh, very good. All right. We'll just give it a minute more. But in the meantime, if anyone would like to volunteer to do um, to take out the minutes, that would save us some time going through the presentations. That gives us more time to do more interesting discussions. Let me put it that way. Are you volunteering, Richard? I will take that as Richard is volunteering. Aha, there you go. Well done. Thank you, sir. So um, I'll call you out in a moment. And if we, do we need a JavaScript for this? I'm tempted to say no. Unless somebody says we should, I'm not going to ask for a JavaScript. Well, do, 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 if I can get this going right. I'm going to try to share my screen from here. Do you want to share your screen? Yes, I did not change my mind. All right. I think people can see my screen. Yes, I can see it clearly. All right, very good. There we go, even better. Um, all right, let's get started. It's a few minutes past the hour and uh, Welcome to ICCRG, everyone. Um, it's ridiculously early for me. It's 4 in the morning for me. Hopefully, it's a more sane time for many of you. Um, but uh, I'm looking forward to this session. Hopefully, this will wake you up. And hopefully, you'll be engaged as we go through this. Um, so let's just start off with a couple of notes uh, at a high level. Just uh, uh, note well. Oh, hang on. Let me fix this so you can actually see it. There you go. Um, I'm reading Chris's note here. All right, Chris, if you're uh, willing and able to do this, I would very much appreciate that then. Um, All right, we'll go through that in a second. So that's the note well. Um, if you haven't uh, taken a look at it, please do. Uh, please read it before you you uh, participate at the mic. Uh, I'm not going to walk through all of it in, 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 in detail. But uh, that and then a note on the code of conduct that we are bound by, the IRTF code of conduct, if this is important, uh, please make sure you've seen this as well um, and read this as well before you participate. Um, and here's a high level goals for the IRTF and, and reminder to folks here that the IRTF is not a standards uh, development organization. It is a research organization. And uh, with that, I will jump into the agenda for today. So we have a, uh, 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 several presentations today and we have a, 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 uh, an excellent uh, agenda here. 
uh, with with uh, events which are we uh, I'll talk about the first one in a moment. But um, we have a number of presentations, and I hope uh, that uh, everybody stays engaged through the entire meeting. I uh, um, I'll thank Richard for for uh, taking down the minutes, and as Chris pointed out on the chat. If somebody wants uh, any comments, my, uh, any comments to be voiced at the mic, please prefix it with the uh, mic in this chat. And um, Chris has offered to kindly deliver them at the mic, and I'll take him up on that. That is about all from, from me. I am going to now uh, kick off the first presentation from Rui. Now, this is a slightly uh, unusual presentation in that we are actually going to be talking about uh, a congestion control uh, that is more um, uh, pre it's more geared towards uh, uh, data centers. Uh, we will kick it off with that presentation. Rui, do you want to? I'm looking here to see. Rui, you'll have to come up and ask for camera and mic. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. OK. Let me get you going. OK, perfect. Go for it. Um, hi, everyone. This is Ray Miao um, from Alibaba Group. So today, we're, we're trying to introduce the uh, HPC++. So we use, use HPC++ to uh, control the congestion precisely which can achieve near zero Q in our data center and also um, maintain very high throughput. So this is our work we published in CCOM uh, 2019. And then after that, we actively deploy this technique into Alibaba Cloud and with many other vendors. So by that time, we think like we are working with many vendors to um, want to standardize this um, algorithm and this design. So uh, we can be aligned in, in, the, in the same uh, setting. So um, uh, next page. OK. So, so the m motivation for our design is like um, today in the cloud, so we design very high performance networking. So there are a couple of motivation um, for our design. First is the first um, uh, application in the cloud right now is very sensitive to uh, uh, latency inflation. For example, in the uh, EBS elastic block storage, the SLA guarantee on the latency is 200 microseconds. And uh, some other like k-value application, memory KD application are uh, also require sub millisecond uh, latency. So we, we think that's makes the network become more and more important. The second is that there's uh, many applications, such as high performance storage and the distributed uh, deep learning application that uh, use advanced hardware that can generate uh, the data orders magnitude faster and also require ultra low latency for those applications. So that network become a new bottleneck in our system. And then the last part is the new architecture is happening in the cloud. For example, the resource disaggregation, which is separate uh, the compute, memory, and the disk into separate resources pools. So even memory access will go through the network in the future. So in this case, the network become uh, very important and especially require very uh, low latency for those settings. So um, please, next page. So to support those applications, um, the silicon manufacturer uh, generate uh, fast ASICs because the traditional software stack cannot keep up with the speed. So the hardware offloading is inevitable. So um, however, using faster hardware can generate traffic more aggressively that the network congestion become a severe problem for our clouds. For example, we run running RDMA in our network we, we find that there are lots of uh, PFC store and also deadlock events. So we find it's necessary to solve the condition control problem in this case. 
next please so um we identify a couple of key issues in our congestion control in our high-speed network the first issue that we observe lots of a pfc store and the deadlock event uh, in our rdma network and we 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 find that's a uh, cause the stability issue in our network. However, we cannot disable PFC because that will affect the application performance as well. So the key, uh, the key uh, insight for those limitations is that the current congestion control algorithm is has has a very slow convergence speed. So so that's the essential part we want to address. The second issue is that we want to run application, a mix of application in the same cluster. However, we cannot achieve both high throughput and the low latency for different applications. So the essential reason for that is the traditional condition control algorithm rely on the standing queue. So when the queue build up, the condition control works, uh, start to work to react to the congestion. However, when the standing queue build up, the application latency has already been um, affected. So the last part is we we run DCQC, which is a state of art congestion control algorithm for the RDMA network, and that we find that those those algorithms rely on the heuristic to configure their uh, algorithm. So, for example, in DCQC, they use at least fifteen um, parameter. So to to uh, to work with the condition control so in our case it's really um, time consuming to tune those parameters to work for different workloads uh, next please so this is why um, we uh, we want to come up with a new condition control algorithm which you can um, address our current issue in our production so um, the new opportunity we found is that new commodity ASICs, switching ASICs, have inbound telemetry ability, which tells what the status in real time that switch has. So the idea is to use inbound telemetry as a precise feedback for congestion control. For, so for example, in this, in this figure, so the sender generate packets uh, of the user data and then when the packet goes through the network, each hop of the switch will add a telemetry information into the packet. So those telemetry information include the queue lengths and the TX bytes and timestamp. Um, so, so to allow us to uh, calculate precisely the, the extent of the congestion. So um, the, the packet continue forward along the path and each switch will attach the telemetry of its own into the packet. When the packet arrives at the destination, the receiver will generate acknowledgement packets back to the sender while putting those telemetry pack information into the ACK packet to allow the sender to adjust the sending rate based on telemetry information. So as I said, the the most important telemetry information we need is the queue length and the TX rates. So which it tells precisely um, if there's a buffer build up for this uh, particular egress port. And more important that if there's no queue build up in, in, the, in the egress port, we still can use the TX rate to quantify the, the occupancy of the link. For example, we can control the link to use as a 95% uh, utilization. So in this case, we can maintain near zero queue because we have a 5% bandwidth buffer to absorb the, the traffic burst, while still we can ensure very high throughput to saturate the, saturate the link. Uh, next. So we, uh, we want to compare our uh, inbound telemetry mechanism uh, with the uh, traditional ECN uh, marking. Uh, ECN 
as we know that a single bit notification of a congestion uh, is a, a simple and efficient uh, being supported by many vendors. Uh, we view that uh, inbound telemetry is an advanced version of ECN, which provides a fine-grained network load information. Um, for example, queue lens, precisely queue lens uh, in terms of bytes or in terms of sales, and also transmit bytes, which allows to uh, generate and calculate the TX rates on the egress port uh, based on the TX byte and the timestamp information. The link capacity actually we use to, con to differentiate uh, different uh, link, either it's 100G link or it's 25G link. Um, the benefit or the key insight we get is first, they can, can convert to uh, appropriate, uh, just, just one round trip time, we can adapt to the uh, correct rates to avoid congestion. While traditional uh, congestion control, if you rely on the heuristics, you, every time you cut to half and it, after multiple round trip time, you can um, adapt to the red uh, sending rate. The second benefit is we can uh, constantly maintain a near zero queue uh, for low latency while still we maintain a very high throughput because we can um, set a, a bandwidth buffer to observe the uh, small burst without actually building up a queue. So there are a couple of uh, numeral comparison or overhead of using in-band telemetry. The first one is we, we, we use in the paper, we allow each packet to carry the telemetry information, which use up uh, to less than 5% of the bandwidth. That's a, a, a ideal case. But in reality, we, we prefer um, to query in-band telemetry information per round trip time. Uh, in this case, we use a standard alpha 1.0, which is IITF standard uh, INT format. And uh, for those standard, we have 200 bytes uh, metadata for the, for the INT, which is account for only 2.5% of the uh, uh, bandwidth. So in this case, we, um, we see that it, because bandwidth is the generally abandoned in the data center. And we, we treat, we use the, um, those small bandwidths uh, for, for low latency. I, I think we, we think it's a good trade-off. Next page. Uh, should I address the question right now or just later for the, after the presentation? Um, that's up to you, Rui. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, I can, I can, I can talk about that. Um, mm -hmm. L4S. Oh, IFS. I, I'm not sh sh quite sure of the detail, but uh, um, it seems like a, uh, another standard in the TSV, VWG, right? So, um, yeah, they they propose to use a, uh, Fangre ECN. Um, um, I'm not sure uh, how to compare it because uh, I, I remember PSL4SE targeting on the wide area network and uh, uh, it's focused on the, the switch support to, to improve the traditional ECN while we're focusing more on the data center environment uh, where the the INT feature can be supported in those switches that can give us uh, more information, and especially for the for the for the data center, the bandwidth is uh, uh, abundant, so we can use the those uh, bandwidth to send the telemetry information. Is the protocol intend to be used on the internet? So right now we're focused more on the, on the data center environment um, because um, you know the, because the telemetry information is uh, uh, more directed to the data center or cloud provider. So those low level uh, congestion information or traffic load information is very sensitive to 
uh, to the to the network operator. So if we if we want to use the internet wide environment, then the one issue is might maybe explode those detailed information to the to the other user. Maybe there are some uh, privacy issue. Um, Rui, just a, a high level point. The chat will keep going on. Uh, okay, I thing. see. You, you may you may want to you may want to finish your presentation and then see if people uh, want to answer questions at the mic, or you can continue the conversation on the chat after your presentation as well. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. So yeah. we we highlight our design. So the the uh, key design is using uh, inbound telemetry as a precise feedback. We can quantify the condition and precisely and react to it precisely. So that, th this gave us three benefits. First, first convergence. So the sender know exactly uh, how to react to the condition, and and it can uh, adapt to the precise array in just one round trip time. The second is we can maintain near zero queue because our feedback doesn't rely on the queue length. Not only rely on the queue length, but also rely on the TX rate. And also, in our case, we have few parameters. Uh, we only have three parameters, and those parameters uh, is not related to the uh, the performance, it's just the trade-off. So in this case, we don't need any heuristic to infer the status because we can directly get what, what's going on in the network. Uh, next. So this is the um, preliminary result from our SmartNIC implementation uh, we deployed. And uh, as we see that uh, in, the, in the left figure show that uh, the axis is a different flow size. Um, the y-axis is a uh, 99 percentile normalized flow competition time. Um, actually, in this figure, the lower the better. The lower means the lower latency. And we compared uh, our design with DCQCN, the, the purple curve, which is the default congestion control in RDMA. And we, as we see that for those small messages, we can reduce the latency by 25%. And uh, even in a median like 200K uh, flows, we can still reduce the latency by uh, 50%, 55%. In the right figure, we show that overall in the, the experiment, uh, the distribution of the queue length in the switch. And as we see that in the HPCC++, we say that in, even in the 99 percentile, the queue length is only 20, 23 kilobytes, which translate to 7 microsecond uh, queuing delay in 25G link, uh, which demonstrate that we can uh, achieve ultra low latency while maintaining near zero Q. Um, that's all for, for my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions right now. Thank you, Rui. Um, I see Vidhi at the mic. Let me. Okay, I thought this was. Hear me? Sorry. There you go, with there yes. You go. Uh, thank you, Rui, for the great presentation. I just have a question in the graph that you were showing. Mm -hmm. um, just the previous slide. Okay. Okay. Uh, can we switch to the previous slide if that's okay? So the first graph, why does the why does the latency becomes normalized like for the purple and the green? I was I was imagining in my head that it would always stay low. Why does it become the same at higher? Uh, at a higher, higher flow size? Flow size? Right. Oh yeah. Oh, so, yeah. so for the higher, for the which, higher means the which means the flow size is larger, larger than one megabyte, for example, is the um, uh, is a, is a uh, throughput, uh, throughput oriented, oriented for those flows, those flows. and those flow maybe, those flow maybe uh, need, uh, a, need a, uh, tens of a tens of rounds, rounds to finish. Right, so, but 
don't we have much better feedback is is this assuming some kind of loss or is it like a real time test i didn't get the environment yeah I'm yeah it's yeah, it's a, yeah, it's, so. a it's a it's a real Vidi, just time very very quickly right. Vidi, there's uh, there's echo coming out of your mic okay uh, if, uh, yeah please mute you... if you're not speaking it might be the best way to do this yeah Go so on, yeah so we we keep the utilization to 95% uh, page. In this case, we have a 5% bandwidth headroom to observe small burst. So in this case, the short flows, like uh, the, the number in the, in, the, in the left, have very uh, low latency uh, because we don't build up the queue. However, if you look at the very tail of this uh, uh, figure, we actually perform worse than the uh, DCQCN for this long flow because they can use 100% uh, throughput, we only use an uh, 85%. That's a difference. Thank you. Uh, Ignacio, you're up next. Um, hi. Um, we, we just comment on the chat that this idea is similar to a protocol discussed in IBBM group the EAOM protocol is different because here you are measuring the, the queues, which is directly related to traffic and congestion. And, but there are several issues that you can find when you try to do this in, in, every, in every step or, or you, you flow. And the, the question is, is if you already knew this uh, protocol that we are discussing um, IPPM, and how do you think that this, the, the second, second question is, how do you think that it's possible to use your protocol when not all, all the steps inside in the path, in the flow paths are collaborating with your protocol? Uh, because if you are thinking that this mm. protocol is mm. developed uh, very slowly, uh, okay, you you will get this this situation. Thank you. Oh, you mean uh, I don't get the related word. Is mean IPVM or IPPM? So, to, to answer your question, I think for uh, for for HPC C plus plus, the uh, we need a separate queue. For our protocol, uh, just like ECN, you need a separate queue for ECN and for TCP traffic as well, right? So we need to have a separate queue uh, for HPC++. Uh, if you don't use the HPC++ for for some of the uh, end house, you might you might have to use a different queue. We, so you we use the queues in the switch to separate different protocols. Let's continue okay. this one on the chat, if you would like, uh, Ignacio. Um, Stuart, you're up next. Hi. I, um, just a quick comment. Uh, I think I understand the confusion uh, that led to Vidi's question. Uh, uh, and this happens a lot when people use the terms latency and delay interchangeably. Mm -hmm. This graph is not showing the latency uh, in the sense of the per packet round trip time. It's showing the total completion yeah. time for the transfer. So when you have a really yeah. large transfer, many, many round trips, the actual per packet latency becomes less important. Yeah. yeah. That's why so, they converge. So, yeah. It so the left fig. More yes. than per packet round trip time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. The left figure shows the transfer. <laughs> The flow combination time, which means the translation uh, delay for this flow, the how, how how much time for the network transmit this particular flow? So, yeah, certainly yep. need a couple of round trip time. For the for the figure in the right, it actually shows the 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 delay of the network because the, the left side shows a CDF of Q length, and so if you if you add about the Transmission delay. This is the queuing delay, right? So this is a queuing delay right. um, distribution. You can you can translate into that. Yeah, my, my comment was just because Vidi was asking on the left graph why the 
lines converge above two megabytes and i just anyway that was my comment just oh i see yeah help clear yeah. that up yeah thanks yeah, thank you thanks Stuart. chris you're up uh relaying for ayush what's the difference between the hpcc presented at sigcom and the hpcc plus plus which is being presented here um, HPCC is, is more academia, uh, like a uh, style. Uh, there are a couple of differences. First one is we use a per packet uh, INT, uh, but uh, in the production, once we, because once we, after the publish uh, on CCOM, we, we work on the vendor to deploy this in, in our production. And, and during this procedure, we'll accumulate a couple insights or, or experience uh, from deploying this protocol, that's come with HPC plus plus. So it's more production ready, and uh, um, it, it's a it's standardizable uh, protocol. Like some of the design is uh, uh, too artificial in the SICOM paper. Uh, so in the HPC plus plus, it's more um, practical and design, and it, it's it's good to uh, align with different vendors because we. Uh, when we deploy this protocol and then we actually talk to different vendors uh, to implement these protocols, uh, we talk to the NIC vendors and also talk to the switch vendors individually. So that's come always uh, uh, we want to standardize so that we can we, we don't have to talk to each one individually, but uh, we're talking in a common language. So that's why we come always this HPC plus plus. There are a couple of uh, a detailed design in, in, in the draft. Um, that's just quite different with the paper version. Yeah, I would encourage people to read the draft uh, as well. Um, Roland, you're up next. Yeah, hi, just a quick question um, about multiple bottlenecks. So did you consider multiple bottlenecks or are they occurring in your setup at all? And the, the network telemetry data, does it allow you mm -hmm. to identify the particular bottleneck for a, a specific flow? Um, in, in the paper version, we consider the multiple bottleneck design. And we actually, we, we carry INT information for each hop so that we can actually know where is the congestion. And uh, we have a, f a complete design to consider all the bottleneck. and. Uh, we actually can change the sending rate, uh, so both based on different uh, policy. So we can say like under the multiple bottleneck, we can achieve maximum fairness or proportional fairness or something in between that is alpha fairness we can achieve. But the later in the in the production deployment, we found that the simplest way is just to do, uh, uh, do the, the 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 maximum fairness. We don't store. Because in multiple bottleneck cases, we need to stop all the information for each hop. That actually costs a, uh, more resources. But the, the 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 benefit is very limited. The benefit is just uh, uh, how how fairness we can achieve. What what fairness we can achieve, and how quickly we can adapt to the uh, the fairness point. But actually, we 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 care more about utilization, utilization convergence, which uh, which can uh, avoid congestion. But we don't care much about fairness convergence, so because the flows are actually very short in our case, yeah. uh, we don't consider. So that that's why we we make a very simple design. Okay. Uh, that that work with the multiple bottleneck case. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you so much, Rui, for that. Um, I'll encourage. This is this is uh, a, a presentation which was. Uh, in part, there's some discussion on the ICCRG mailing list. People seem to be interested in uh, discussing and engaging in data center congestion controllers. So if people are interested in that, I would encourage you to engage on this more on the mailing list. And I'll, I'll also encourage Rui to, to bring these up on the mailing list. We are trying to gauge how much interest there is in topics uh, around DC congestion control. If there is interest, please bring it up on the mailing list. It will be good to know. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll, I have already uh, copied these comments. I will reply in the email. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Rui. 
Uh, with that, we will move on to the next presentation of the day. Let me see if I can. Uh, Robin, you're up. Yep, mic is on. Yep. All right. Um, so for those people who've seen this uh, yesterday, don't worry, it's, it contains a lot of new information <laughs> so you don't get too bored. Uh, next slide, please. So QLog stands for uh, Quick Logging. And this project uh, started about two years ago when we identified that the new protocols would probably get uh, quite complex to actually analyze uh, and debug in practice. And we're going to need some advanced tooling to do that. What you typically do for something like TCP, for example, uh, next slide, is you would take a, a packet capture somewhere in the network, right, and then analyze that using something like uh, Wireshark, for example. This is still possible for quick, but quite a bit more difficult because, next slide, quick, of course, encrypts most of its uh, transport level metadata as well. So to do this, you would have to store the entire packet capture, including the very large payloads, and also the TLS decryption secrets, um, leading to obvious privacy and scalability issues. There's, however, a second, more long-standing problem with, with uh, the typical way that we do this. Next slide. Which is, of course, that a lot of um, uh, protocol information isn't always reflected on the wire. And that's, of course, always the case for congestion control information like the congestion window, which I don't have to tell all of you. And so, um, to solve these problems or, or to try and solve them for quick, we propose a different approach. Next slide. Um, where the idea is instead of doing a network based capture, let's uh, log this information at the endpoints directly from the implementations. But obviously, all have all the salient data right there available and they can easily leave out the, the privacy sensitive parts. This is, of course, not a brand new idea. Many implementations have some kind of debugging output, for example. But the idea of QLog is to have like a single format, a single schema that all the different implementations can use, uh, making it easier for us to create reusable tooling uh, on top of that. And so the next slide, um, uh, QLog really is not rocket science. It's relatively simple. Currently, we just map this into JSON and we define how, for example, a received packet containing an acknowledgement frame should look like, or indeed on the right side, what uh, uh, you should call the variables uh, related to, for example, uh, just control updates. Using this type of uh, log as input, we were then able to create quite a few indeed uh, reusable tools. Next slide, um, which are available in the QVIS tool suite. Uh, one of those is, for example, here, the, the sequence diagram, where in the middle you see the, the packets going over the wire uh, from client server and vice versa and their contents, but on the right side, you see um, uh, implementation side updates, including, for example, uh, when, when a probe timeout timer was set or indeed when the, the bytes in flight was updated, allowing for very fine grained um, um, debugging of these, these systems. Uh, next slide. Um, a second major tool that we have um, in QVIS is, is a kind of, you can call it the TCP trace, but then for quick, um, where because of this approach, we, we, we don't just show the, the data and the acknowledgements and the flow control. We can also show just a window, bytes and flight, and also the various round trip time measurements that are used um, internally immediately. Um, and so for me, as definitely a non-expert in congestion control, I really like this type of thing where you see the, the very clear correlation between the, the congestion window rising and the RTT going up um, with that as well. It's very interesting to see this so, so graphically. Um, next slide. Um, this, this tool has then been used by quite a few implementers. For example, this is from a, a blog post from Cloudflare, who explain in detail how they've used this to debug their initial cubic and, uh, and high start implementation for their quick stack. Uh, next slide. Um, but it's also going beyond uh, initial deployment, uh, initial implementation debugging. For example, what Facebook has done is they have deployed QLog um, at scale in their data centers as well. And so they've been able to find quite a few um, 
relatively quick specific bugs in their setup that were previously missed in, in lab testing that only really surfaced during their deployment. Um, for example, um, uh, one of the things they had was that they were underestimating bandwidth during the zero RTT phase because they were relying on, on previously acknowledged packets, um, which during zero RTT you do not have previously acknowledged packets, um, at least not once containing uh, um, application layer data. Another one that is in a very interesting paper um, that I'll link to on the bottom there was that in Quick you change encryption levels, and that uh, is accompanied by um, you can do that with implicitly acknowledging all the packets from the previous uh, encryption level. And the way they did that was they they uh, uh, mismeasured the the RTT there, so RTT was suddenly much much lower than it actually was because of the implicit acknowledgments, again causing a, a wrong bandwidth estimation mm -hmm. from that. Oh, there you go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so um, the thing is that no, no, previous slide, please. <laughs> so the the thing is that this has been used not just by um, the experts or the people that knew that they were doing uh, to great effect, but I think in Quick we had this um, very un. Um, special situation where you have a lot of quick implementers that are really not congestion control experts by themselves. And they, they have to try to make something working based on the drafts and, and looking at other people's code. And I think this kind of tool and approach has really helped them to get their things at least somewhat working. Um, next slide. And I think that's, that's one of the main reasons that QLog has found quite a bit of support within the quick community, most of the implementations actually. Uh, output this directly uh, as well. And as I said, Facebook is using this uh, extensively in production. And it's because of this that uh, the, the format has, has shown promise and the tools seem useful that we are now moving for adoption of this work by the Quick Working Group. Uh, next slide. Which is intended to happen uh, somewhere uh, over, over the next months as part of the Quick Recharger. Uh, one of the goals there is to flash out all of this for, for Quick. Um, we have some basic adjust control stuff in there, but for example, Facebook, they have added a lot of custom events as well uh, to help them better um, debug their, their, their custom setups. And so it's going to be an interesting to see if we how we need to update the default QLog stuff to, to uh, match that. A second main thing, and, and one of the main reasons I'm here today, is that we're also trying to figure out if this can be extended to more than just Quick. Um, logically, of course, things like TCP or the multi part versions of these or things like mask or general tunneling um, also, of course, have to deal with uh, aspects of congestion control uh, and can get quite complex. And we hope this approach could be useful for those things as well, with the ideal goal of creating tools that can be reused across protocols. Um, next slide. So we also have a few uh, proof of concept uh, projects around that. For example, for TCP, we've been playing around with uh, eBPF and using k-probes to get this kind of information bubbled up from the kernel. We then combine these with the, the raw packet captures from Wireshark to get like a full view of what the TCP stack, for example, in Linux is doing, um, which has led to some, some interesting observations. Next slide. Um, we've also been playing around with this for multi parts quick. And we have an ongoing project looking at this for multiple TCP as well, where we tag each event with a specific path ID so we can split them out later and have a comparison between the different paths, of course. Um, so it shows definite promise. It looks like we will be able to do this. However, we are also running against a few uh, challenges or the bottlenecks. Next slide. Um, for example, we've recently started a major push towards actual performance testing of, of quick stacks. Um, and QLog currently, as I said, is JSON based, which is flexible, but it's also not super optimized, uh, for example, in terms of file size. And so testing um, uh, performance on, on gigabit networks has turned out to be quite difficult to scale. Um, there are, um, uh, however, other people like, for example, Nick Banks from, uh, from Microsoft, they are using a custom, similar approach, but they are using a more optimized format and custom tools where they are able to ingest much, much larger log files and much, much more information to help debug this kind of uh, high-performance scenario. 
So I think a general approach is, is, is good. We just need to look at how we implement it um, specifically. And that's one of the discussions that we will definitely have for QLog. Um, one of the problems that I have there is, is it's kind of the main puller of this thing. Next slide. Is that again? I am not a. Uh, I'm not an expert. I don't. I don't implement these things myself. I don't test them. I don't do research. Um, so I don't know what 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 the the typical way of working for this is. Either research or in, or in actual deployment. I've seen things like this come along here in this in this research group. Um, this was from a couple of meetings ago, which seems fantastically interesting as a tool. It's unclear, for example, here, I, I don't know if you can actually log the individual congestion control windows or if that's even useful, right? Um, and so, next slide. Um, the fact that I need more feedback became obvious uh, early or in the early days when I talked to Jana, um, asking, you know, how, how can we improve this TCP trace for quick? And he said, the simplest thing you could do is add uh, this type of thing, a ruler, where I can just drag and drop um, across the, um, the data line here, and it shows me about what the data rate was and how how long it took, which is really really simple to implement. I think I did that in about one hour, and I would have never thought of that myself that that would actually be useful in practice. So it's that kind of input that was really really useful for me to uh, to optimize this tool. Now where am I going with this uh, final slide? Because of course the, the ITF does not standardize tools. Um, I don't want to make this all about the tools, but I do think that if the goal is to have a format that can be reused across implementations and protocols, and that we can then build reusable tools on top of, that it might be a good idea to start from the tools and then work our way backwards to make sure that we are not missing things that are very useful in practice or are actually being used um, right now. So we're looking for uh, feedback now on formats and then ideas you might have had there, and also some things that you might have had as input from tools. Um, most of this work for, for practical reasons will happen in the quick working group, even though we're also looking for other protocols um, as well. And we will, of course, have some very good input already because there are uh, a lot of knowledgeable people involved in quick with this as well. But extra feedback and opinions are always welcome there or using uh, the GitHub, of course, right now, uh, as I'm interested in hearing feedback and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation, Robin. Uh, we have time for just a couple of quick questions. But I want to uh, um, uh, quickly say that I'm, I'm grateful for Robin for presenting this here and, of course, for the work that he's doing. This is super, super useful for Quick. But as he points out, it's super helpful for for, for transports as well, people who wanted to do uh, and use tooling that's um, that's more modern, so to speak, will find this to be extremely useful. Okay, John, uh, Jonathan, you're 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 up. Uh, thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask what sort of compression algorithm you're using to get the eighteen megabytes. Oh, uh, that's just normal zip. Normal just, just zip. Okay, so presumably a more advanced compression would get it down smaller. Sure, and, and for storage and transfer, that's fine for now, but it's mainly if you want to load this. For example, Archivist tools are all web-based, and your browser really mm -hmm. doesn't like you uploading a gigabyte JSON file or, yeah. or, or, or downloading the compressed version and then having to unzip it in the browser is also not something it likes to do. So. Yeah, okay. All right. It looks like we don't have anybody else in the queue, but oh, Jake, you're up. It's Richard, okay, I'm going to close the queue after Richard, but Jake, you're up next. Yeah, hi. I, I do think this looks very interesting. Has anybody started doing anything with this for uh, for TCP? Like, this seems like it does have obvious applications. Um, not, not concretely. Like, we have the proof of concepts, but those are more like research uh, projects. I do know that people at Facebook and Google have shown interest in, in applying this to uh, to TCP as well, and I think even Apple as well um, to doing that. But I don't know of any concrete efforts yet, but I'm very interested in hearing from people. Okay, thanks. Uh, 
so I would just wanted to uh, basically chime into the same horn here. And I think it's uh, very interesting to have a, a standardized way to log these um, congestion control internal events, um, especially useful for TCP, obviously, uh, because right now, um, at least I am faced with at least three different approaches how to diagnose and troubleshoot um, uh, TCP. And none of them are standardized, so they all need their specialized tool sets. They may need the uh, recompilations of the stack and so forth. Thanks for that comment, Richard. I'll say that uh, uh, at a high level, um, <clears throat> just two quick points before I let Robin go. One is that the Q log tool, the Q log uh, schema is different from the visualization tool. And that's actually quite, quite an important distinction here. To your point uh, there, Richard, which is that if you want to extend the, with the schema to include more events in TCP and so on and so forth, that is an uh, excellent, uh, uh, that that would be very useful work, I think. Uh, I'm speaking for Robin here. But uh, at the moment, in the quick working group at least, this is going to be taken up and the focus is going to be what needs to be logged for quick, not for other protocols. But if there are extensions that you need to make or if you want to extend the schema for the future, that work would be very useful to do now because I imagine that if you want to adopt this sort of work in other working groups, then having that work done before it gets there would be very useful. All right. I will uh, thank uh, Robin for his presentation. And Martin, you get to jump into the queue and say something. Uh. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Jan. John. I just want to say, yeah, as, as responsible AD for TCPM and TSVWG, um, I think would, I would be very interested in drafts for events in those protocols and other transport protocols um, appearing in those working groups to standardize in the QLog framework. Thank you, Martin, and uh, thank you, Robin. Thanks all. Right. To the next one. Uh, Anna, I think you're up. I should. OK, thank you, Jana. So I am going to talk about the congestion control in congestion control in the multipath uh, context. And this is a work that has been done as part of our work on multipath uh, DCCP. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today uh, is also applicable for, for other uh, protocols. So the general problem of congestion control in congestion control for multipath. And uh, this is joint work with colleagues at Deutsche Telekom, City University of London, and my colleagues at Karlsruhe University. And in particular, the results that I will talk about today is from our PhD student at Kost University, Marcus Pieske. So next slide, please. Uh, so first, a little bit uh, about the background and context. So uh, we are working on multipath DCCP as a, a multipath solution for uh, transporting general IP traffic or UDP traffic. And uh, this framework is using DCCP as uh, the protocol. So you have one DCCP uh, tunnel per path. And the, the two main use cases uh, that we have in mind for this is uh, in the context of uh, 3GPP and uh, access traffic uh, steering, switching, and splitting architecture that is being defined there for combining cellular and Wi-Fi networks and uh, also for the hybrid access uh, use case in, in home networks where you combine the fixed and the cellular link for uh, better performance. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so then uh, let's look at the, the problem uh, that we then encounter if we have this type of, of multipath uh, framework and and this is generic uh, for the protocol as I said so this tunneling solution uh, of course results in nested congestion controls and this can also be a, a problem for for single path single path uh, uh, tunneling but when you move into the multipath uh, context uh, this uh, encounters of course an, an added uh, complexity 
And uh, in uh, our work, we are using uncoupled congestion control over the, the two paths uh, in all the cases, as uh, the use cases here, uh, we don't see the need for coupling the congestion control as the idea is to, to use the two paths and to be able to, to aggregate them and, and use them for the better performance. And we don't expect the, the fairness issues to come into play here. So you see the general setup on the picture here, you have a, a UE and then you have a, a, a proxy or a, a tunneling endpoint where you in this figure have a, a downlink transfer. So you have the scheduling uh, component uh, in this end and then you have two paths, two multi paths with a congestion control, uh, a reordering component for the packets and then you have the also the congestion control from the UE and the to the server. Uh, next slide. So uh, this uh, scheduling and reordering components will have a very large impact on the performance in this uh, scenario. So in this uh, results that I will talk about today and also for a lot of the, the work uh, we have done here, we have looked particularly as at the, the cheapest path uh, first a scheduler or the, the strict priority scheduler. So you have a prefer, preferred path and you send data on this path whenever you have a space available in your congestion window. And it's only if this uh, uh, preferred path is not available that you start to use your, your other paths. And this is also, of course, uh, we think a quite reasonable uh, scheduler for the scenario that we are targeting because uh, you may, for instance, want to use your, your Wi-Fi network and then only use your uh, cellular quota if, you, if the Wi-Fi network does not provide the sufficient uh, performance or you use your, your fixed network in the hybrid access scenario and then use your cellular network for uh, improved performance when needed. So this is a a scheduler that uh, uh, can have benefits both from the user perspective and also from the operator perspective. Uh, the reordering component can also have uh, different uh, uh, functions and I think Marcus will talk uh, particularly about reordering in the, the next talk. Uh, but in the work I'm presenting here, we're using an adaptive uh, time limit uh, for, for the reordering to determine if uh, to pass the packets on uh, or not, as we may not have a, a reliable transfer also over the, the tunnel paths. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I mentioned that if we move to the multipath domain, we have some additional uh, challenges uh, for the congestion control in congestion control, and uh, particularly uh, the challenge in, in this scenario is to be able to aggregate the capacity over the two paths. So you're using uh, one path as your, your preferred path and uh, the challenge then is to actually be able to also use the second path when needed. And in particular, uh, the end-to-end -end congestion control uh, may react uh, before and slow down before you are able to actually start to utilize that path. Uh, if we take the, the next slide. Uh, and here we have an example of this. So what you see in this graph is uh, a time sequence of four different uh, transmissions uh, stacked on top of each other. And for each one, you see the, the green uh, throughput is for the preferred path and the red uh, throughput is for the second path. So up at the top of the, uh, the topmost uh, scenario, you see that uh, things work as you would like it. You have uh, capacity using both the first path and the second path. Uh, the second scenario from the top, uh, on the other hand, does not work uh, well at all. You're not able to use any of the second path, so only the capacity on the first path is actually uh, utilized. And then we have two examples where you kind of manage to use some of the, the capacity of the second path and the 
uh, in general, the, the use here is going up and down a bit. And this is uh, experiments with four different configurations that shows how different the outcome can actually be here, depending on uh, a number of parameters that impact this performance. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the results that I'm showing here is uh, using a, a user space uh, implementation uh, of this uh, multipath uh, framework. So there is also a, a kernel level uh, implementation developed by uh, the colleagues at Deutsche Telekom available that uh, uh, Marcus presented the last IETF in the TSVWG session, some measurements from there. Uh, but here we use uh, a user space implementation, which of course offered an quite a lot of flexibility in uh, trying out different uh, protocols and different uh, uh, configurations. Uh, and uh, this user space uh, program uh, Do you hear me? Okay, something seemed to have happened there with the Good luck. I'm back. Okay. When, when did you lose me? <laughs> so I was uh, explaining that we are using a multi the user space uh, framework for this uh, uh, experiments and this offers then uh, a lot of flexibility in how to try out different uh, scheduling methods and, and different uh, protocols. So in this framework, the packets are captured through the a Linux Tune device and then the framework encapsulates the packets with information like the, the path sequence numbers and the timestamps of the packets. And then packets are scheduled over two uh, single path sockets. So this means that the framework as such is not uh, tied to DCCP. It also allows us to use other protocols uh, as tunnels. So in the experimental results, we have both uh, 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 DCCP and uh, TCP in uh, the experiment uh, that you will see in the next slide. Uh, so this is the setup of the experiments uh, on the end-to-end -end path. It's the IP tunneling where we have TCP on top. So we have used TCP cubic and TCP uh, BBR. And in the tunnel, Okay, so I think maybe I will turn off my video because this maybe is messing up with the... Okay, so uh, uh, as I said, for the tunnel, we are use it, using both uh, TCP, uh, TCP New Reno and TCP BBR, and then we are using uh, DCCP with the uh, CCI D2, which corresponds to new Reno and also a new CCID, uh, CCID5, which is an implementation uh, of uh, BBR uh, style congestion control for DCCP. And uh, we have uh, uh, some base uh, delays for the, the two different paths on the multipath and for the added delay uh, to the server, uh, 20 milliseconds on, on the preferred path and an additional 20 milliseconds to the server as a baseline and a symmetric path as a baseline with 40 milliseconds to the second uh, over the second path and uh, the same bandwidth and same uh, queue configurations on both paths. So next slide please. Uh, so now some example uh, Results, so short here stands for the basic configuration. And what we see here is the combination of different congestion controls uh, uh, on the end-to-end -end path and then in the, the tunnel. And uh, the results are relative to the performance over a single path. So you see a, a uh, percentage of the, the flow completion time for downloading uh, a large file here. So if you're below 100%, you have gained uh, performance as compared to the uh, single path case. And uh, you can see here that uh, the performance uh, varies a lot depending on what 
congestion control uh, combinations you use. Uh, in general, BBR is performing better as a tunnel protocol. And this is as BBR reacts uh, faster uh, when you start to experience uh, congestion and there is also less uh, loss uh, uh, over the tunnel uh, with BBR. And you can also see that uh, BBR at endpoints with Reno in the tunnel performs uh, uh, very poorly here because BBR uh, reacts before the, the second path is uh, used. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here we have uh, another scenario where we look at the impact of where you put the, uh, the tunnel endpoint in relation to the, the server. So uh, the short uh, near scenario here, the, the proxy uh, is closer to the UE and you have more of a difference between the round trip times uh, end to end and uh, over the tunnel. Uh, whereas the, the short distance, then the proxy is further away and closer to the server. Uh, and you can see that this placement of the uh, tunnel endpoint uh, also has a, a large impact on performance. And uh, having the proxy closer to the user, uh, to the UE as expected, is uh, typically beneficial uh, because in this case, uh, you have more of a difference between the two control loops when you have uh, more difference in the RTTs. Uh, and uh, in particular, you can see that uh, if the two RTTs are, are similar, then BBR uh, over BBR uh, performs uh, quite poorly. Uh, next slide, please. And this is uh, taking a little uh, closer look at this particular scenario of BBR uh, over BBR. So what you see on the x-axis here is the end-to-end -end RTT. And on the y-axis, you have the portion of that RTT that is within the tunnel. Uh, and you can see very clearly here how this has an impact on performance. And uh, if you have, uh, have a, a similar, uh, similar RTT between the, the two paths, then uh, uh, BBR here is reacting uh, with a similar attempt to fill the bottleneck and is not able to move the, the traffic over to the, to the second path. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so to summarize, uh, the congestion control and congestion control aspect has a, a lot of impact on the performance on the, the multipath uh, tunneling problem. And uh, there's a lot of, of factors that interact here. So the results that we saw here were particular to the, the scheduling mechanism of, of cheapest uh, pipe first. And it also has a, a large impact what the ordering mechanism you use. Uh, the different congestion controls have quite uh, different interactions. Uh, the placement of the proxy, of course, is also quite uh, important, as well as the, the path characteristics. And if we should have some, some first general conclusions uh, from uh, the, the work we are, going, uh, we are working on, we can see that overall BBR performs better than Reno as the congestion control for the tunnel. Uh, and having the proxy close to the user, uh, as expected, is typically beneficial. And uh, we are actively working on this, uh, playing with the different uh, parameters and, and analyzing the, the various interactions. So uh, I hope that more results will also uh, be coming. And uh, with the next slide. And there are also a number of uh, drafts that are related to this presentation. So there's a draft for the multipath DCCP uh, protocol. There is a draft related to the, the framework, uh, multipath framework, uh, some draft related to how to uh, send DCCP uh, efficiently over UDP. Uh, there is a draft on reordering that I think Marcus will talk about next. And there's also a draft on multipath schedulers. Uh, and with that, I uh, am happy to have questions.
Thank you, Anna. Uh, let's keep this quick because we'll have questions uh, after Marcus's presentation next as well. Uh, I'll close the mic line here after Gauri, but Martin, you're up. Thank you, Anna. This is very interesting. Um, how applicable do you think these results are to non multipath scenarios that have congestion control and congestion control, like mask? So, I mean, the the particular problem of, of using the second path, which is the main challenge here, uh, will not happen unless you have, have multiple paths, of course. Uh, some, of the, some of the aspects that we see here, uh, for instance, the relation between uh, the different control loops in terms of, of RTT and the impact of what what the congestion control is you use in the tunnel versus what you use end to end uh, will also come into play in the single path context, but uh, the, the results are not directly transferable, of course. Gauri, you're up next. We don't hear you, Gauri. Uh, on slide 11. I was curious with your heat map and um, how this would play out if there was a much larger RTT at place. You know, is it, so so can you just talk me through a little bit more about what's going on? Yeah, so yeah, what so you what see you here see? is that the end-to-end -end RTT is going from a very small RTT from, you know, I think the smallest value used is five here and up to about a hundred milliseconds and then on the y-axis you see what portion of that RTT is in the tunnel. So as you go up on the y-axis you have more and more uh, of the RTT is inside the, the tunnel which means that the, the proxy is further away from the UE. Is the blue and hole around 20, just an artifact of the analysis? Uh, the blue hole around 20? I'm not sure what you, you mean up in the top there? Yeah, yeah, the top. Yeah, right I, think that, I think that's just a, a random effect. So, I mean, what we have done here is that we have sampled this space with the number of, of measurements. And uh, so each, measure, each measurement point here is, is uh, you know, not repeated many times. It's, it's like 400 samples over the space sure. to create this heat map. So there is there is some noise in, in this uh, graph, of course, but uh, you can see uh, quite uh, clearly that the, uh, yeah, the, that the, the blue space is quite separated from the red. So you can see quite clearly the impact of the two control loops and, and the difference between the RTTs in the two cases. Thanks. That, that's really nice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, this would be uh, the same space, but I'm going to bring this up. Marcus, you're up. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Yeah. So I want to talk today about the multipass sequence maintenance, what this means. I will elaborate in the next slide. So next slide, please. Yeah, S starting with uh, how multipass typically works, which components are, are usually employed. So let's have first a look into the, the picture. Um, so on the left, there's a sender. On the, on the right, you have a receiver. Uh, and in between, that is now uh, very much uh, related to multipass. You have at least two communication paths. Um, and on sender side, you have a scheduler, which is responsible to distribute traffic across the multiple paths. So you can have different logics for this. And you will find a number of logics already described in the uh, ICCRG scheduler draft. Um, while on the receiver side, 
you probably have a reorder reordering mechanism. So here is called reordering queue, and that is exactly where we want to focus on today on how can we ensure um, the sequence maintenance when it comes to, to multipass. Um, between sender and receiver, uh, a multipass network protocol takes responsibility um, to allow the communication between sender and receiver. And typically, in such uh, scenarios, when it comes to heterogeneous environments, you have a latency delta between the multiple paths uh, employed in the communication. And that is exactly the issue um, where I want to talk about. So with this latency delta, you can imagine when we simultaneously use the two paths. So maybe we send the packets in a round robin fashion. Um, that will cause out of order delivery on receiver side. Um, and with that, it completely differs from the characteristic of a single path communication because in a single path communication, you're only dependent um, from, from, from the latency of, of the single path. Um, so keeping it short here, having a latency delta between multiple paths causes some trouble and services with a certain expectation on data sequence and consistency will experience issues. Um, if you look at ITF, you see there are multiple multipass protocols uh, defined or available as a draft. That is multipass TCP, multipass DCCPA, multipass QUIC, CMT, SCTP, and so on. Um, and it would be interesting to see in the next slides how they behave uh, when it comes to out-of-order delivery and which mechanisms they have um, implemented to, to overcome this. Um, nevertheless, typically scheduling and reordering are not part of the protocol specification and it's left to the implementers um, to, to take care. And that might cause trouble if an implementation is dependent on protocol mechanisms. We will come to this in the next slides. Um, so for empty TCP, reordering is simple to view the strict reliability of TCP, so it's a trust just to wait approach uh, on the receiver side. Um, but if you look into the next slide, then we see that there are a number of uh, multipass protocols which claim to provide no strict reliable in order delivery. And that is, for example, the multipass DCCP. It's also the combination of a concurrent multipass uh, SCTP combined with the partial reliability uh, functionality from SCTP. Um, it's also uh, the multipass quick when it becomes combined uh, with the quick data crumb. Um, so from, from today's perspective, uh, I think they should consider sequence maintenance in their design, but I, from my feeling, uh, that is not complete, completely given right now. Um, so for the three protocols I mentioned on this slide, the DCCP, SCTP, and, and QUIC, um, then it becomes combined with the unreli unreliable transmission. Um, then strict reliability is, is not an option, obviously. Um, and the solution, if we talk about sequence maintenance, will be a trade-off between maintaining the data sequence without interrupting the data flow. Um, a special challenge in this scenario is when it comes to, to packet loss. And uh, I think it's likely when, when we talk about multipath transmission that uh, we will see packet loss to some extent. And then this is all, always combined with the question, so how long do we have to wait in a potential reordering mechanism on receiver side? And at one point, at, 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 at which point in time, we can assume that a packet is really lost and we have not to wait for it any longer. So during the multipath protocol design, this has to be considered and possible measures like different sequencing schemes. So for example, a sequencing scheme for path and separately for the multipath connection or a sender receiver signaling have to be taken into account. I will come to this in the next slides. 
Um, yeah, with this draft we have available as ICCRG, the multipass reordering draft now in version two, we claim to cover all these aspects and provide guidelines for design and implementers of multipass protocols. Next slide, please. Yeah, okay, let's have a deeper look into what we have specified so far in the draft. So we discuss uh, several mechanisms to support smooth and a trustable in order delivery for multipath communication. In this draft, scheduling is out of scope. So scheduling uh, maybe also provides some, some measurements to, to, out, uh, to overcome out of order delivery on receiver side. But we see is this rather as part of the uh, scheduler draft available at ICCRG. So we discuss, for example, resequencing mechanism with which we want to keep the generated sequence of data at receiver side. And there we discuss multiple uh, functionalities or multiple logics. So the first is the passive one. So we trust forward packets as arrived. For sure, uh, that will not reorder at all. And then we have the exact mechanism that is similar to TCP uh, and provides strict reliability. Another mechanism is the static expiration. That means we wait a certain time for missing packets until we assume a packet loss and any packet with, which arrive in time will be reordered. Adaptive expiration is similar to the static expiration, but we do not have a fixed time threshold. So we dynamically adjust the time uh, on how we how long we wait for a missing packet, depending on the RTT, for example, uh, or the latency um, on the path. Then we have delay equalization, strictly uh, spoken, that is, is not a reordering mechanism that just delay uh, the faster packets to match the latency of the uh, slower path. And last but not least, we uh, discuss fast packet loss detection, that is probably something that can be uh, combined um, with the other logics um, and that leverage the path and connection sequencing to, to have a very early idea um, about if a packet is, is lost or delayed. Next slide, please. Then we have two other areas um, identified which can help to overcome out of order delivery. Uh, that is recovery and retransmission. In the recovery area, uh, we see that we can overcome packet loss when we spend redundancy. And in that uh, area, we see forward error correction, but also network coding. And when it comes to retransmission, so overcome packet loss by, by retransmission, we also see, we see three different uh, mechanisms which can help here. On the one hand, we have the signaling, uh, which is, for example, used in, in TCP or DCCP uh, to sig signal outstanding packets to, to the sender. Uh, anticipated means we predict a beneficial uh, early retransmission for, for the reordering, pur reordering purpose. And last but not least, we have the flow selection. So the abil ability to retransmit uh, packages on a path different to the original one, if this is if, if this supports the reordering. As I said, combinations of mechanisms are in principle possible and most probably useful. Next slide, please. Yeah, first of all, I want to invite you to, to contribute to this draft uh, where I think that this is apl applicable to many of the multipass protocols um, discussed or standardized at IETF. So the, the draft itself is still under development and some content is not finalized. However, you have uh, got an idea today on which mechanisms um, yeah, about which mechanisms we think. Um, and my question today is, is there any mechanism which is missing so far? And my second question is um, how to proceed with this draft? Do you see any value in that? Yeah, and with that, I'm ready for today and now I would like to see some feedback.
Thank you, Marcus. <clears throat> I don't see anybody at the queue, and I don't want to spend a lot of time waiting, but I'll give it just 30 seconds if somebody wants to come up to the mic and offer feedback. In the meantime, I'll, I'll, I'll offer, Marcus, that to your question about uh, how do you want to proceed with this draft. I think the one thing I would recommend is, is, is engaging the group on the mailing list and, and seeing if we can generate discussion. That's always a good way to, 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 to get people interested. Um, Andre is in the queue. You're up, Andre. Andre, we cannot hear you. I'm not sure what's going on there, but uh, I... I'll try to get myself. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, go on. Okay, sorry. Um, Andre Bondi, Software Performance and Scalability Consulting in New Jersey. Uh, my question for Marcus is, how do you go about setting the adaptive expiration time? What are the variables that go into that? Uh, is this something that you're going to do at connection setup so that you can establish what a floor on the latency would be? And uh, how do you go about ex increasing the expiration time? Because if you make it too large, uh, there's going to be an issue. And uh, then there's a problem uh, of degraded throughput if you assume that you have a longer latency on the slower pipe. Yeah, uh, very good question. Thank you for that um, short answer here. Um, we have some implementation in the multipass DCCP available uh, for that. And there we continuously update uh, the timer with RTT information we get from the sender during transmission. So we have some signaling mechanism implemented for that. And second point, you are totally right. Uh, we have to set some boundaries. So it doesn't make sense to let the uh, reordering queue uh, grow to an infinite value um, that would slow down the total throughput. So uh, one measure could be here to, to set a manual uh, limit. Yeah. On the signaling, is that going to be in-band or out-of-band? That is to say, along the connection, the payload connection, or on a separate connection? Yeah, the, yeah that is exactly uh, why I think we need this draft. Uh, and that is a question which should, should be mentioned there. And then it's on, on the particular protocol to think about, should this be something which is in or out-of-band? So we, we would not give a final, or I don't see that we have to give a final recommendation to a particular protocol. That is, we, we just give some guidelines and, and, and such questions you have put now, um, should this be something protocol specific or out of band or whatever, uh, that then has to be decided um, within the uh, particular uh, working groups. Okay, it may be server specific, just the way one uses out of band signaling for circuit switch telecom. SS7, for instance? Oh, <laughs> that, is, that is now very specific. Um, <clears throat> SS7, from my knowledge, uses STDP, right? Yeah, it, it just goes along on a separate trunk, actually. Yeah, this is old yeah. stuff. Yeah, I, yeah, OK. Um, I mean, really old stuff, like yeah. 30, 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to jump so, in here, Marcus. Let's let's take that question onto the chat. Yeah. Um, sure. Okay. We do need to move on, but thank you for your questions, Andre. Very much appreciated. Sure. I'm going to move you. on to the next presentation, and thank you again, Marcus and Anna, for your presentations. I think we should continue the discussion on uh, on on the list. Uh, coming up next, BBR, Neil, take it away. Uh, let's see. Can you guys hear my audio? Uh, again, yes, can you can hear audio. audio. Okay, great. Um, all right, uh, so thanks, Jana. Yeah, we just wanted to give a uh, quick update on uh, the BBR-related work that's going on uh, in our team at Google. Uh, and this is joint work uh, with my colleagues uh, listed here. Um, uh, next slide, please. So uh, I think this will be a, a, a shorter talk than many of our recent talks uh, at the ITF. Just wanted to give a quick update on uh, the deployment status at Google. 
uh, where we're nearing completion for uh, internal TCP traffic. Uh, give a quick update on the uh, alpha open source release on GitHub. Um, talk about some plans with respect to internet drafts. And then also talk about our continued work on uh, what we're calling BBR that Swift. Uh, and of course, as always, you know, we're just offering this in, in the spirit of uh, offering our experience uh, with uh, these kinds of experiments in, in deployment. And of course, we are always um, looking for uh, feedback or test results, issues people run into, uh, any ideas or, or patches folks want to contribute would be, would be great. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in terms of the um, ongoing deployment of the BBRv2 algorithm within uh, Google, um, for Google internal traffic, um, this is coming pretty far along. Uh, right now, we're in the process of deploying uh, BBRv2 uh, as the default uh, TCP congestion control for internal Google traffic. Um, and uh, we've gotten to a point recently where uh, it's used as the congestion control algorithm for over 98% of the internal TCP traffic uh, as measured by uh, traffic rate or traffic volume. Um, just to be clear here, so for this internal traffic, uh, we're using a number of different congestion signals. Uh, you know, we're using the core uh, BBR um, approach of modeling the bandwidth and volume around trip time. Uh, but we're also using uh, ECN and loss as signals as well. Um, and as we deploy this, we're seeing some uh, latency reductions at the tail uh, for RPC traffic. And this is as compared to the previous uh, congestion control, which for internal traffic was um, based on a shallow threshold uh, ECN uh, algorithm. Um, and then we also uh, have ongoing work um, for looking at BBRv2 for Google external traffic, so basically uh, YouTube and Google.com traffic over the public internet to end users, uh, and that work uh, continues. Uh, we're seeing some reduced uh, queuing delays um, and reduced packet loss uh, versus uh, BBRv1, um, but we're still not quite where we'd like to be, and so we're continuing to work on that. Uh, and of course, we're continuing to, to iterate uh, in internal uh, lab tests and experiments as well. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the status of the algorithm and code, um, as we've mentioned uh, at the ITF a few times uh, before, we've got a, a release of the uh, both the Quick and the Linux TCP code uh, that's available. The um, Linux TCP code is on GitHub, and uh, we've made a couple of recent um, minor updates to that code. We based it onto a, a more recent version of Linux, uh, for those who are interested, and posted a few uh, minor bug fixes. Um, and we think the, the PBRv2 uh, alpha release is, is ready for experiments, and I think there have been uh, reports you know, over the past uh, year or two from other folks in industry and academia who have taken a look at it, both in uh, production settings and in lab uh, settings. Um, and there are just some links in the slides to previous talks where we've uh, given more details about the algorithm and the code and, and how it behaves. Uh, next slide, please. So we, um, there have been a number of requests for uh, updating the PBR internet drafts. Um, they, the ones that are out there currently uh, document the version one of the algorithm. Um, and uh, we are now uh, planning to go ahead and uh, update those to reflect uh, BBR v2. Um, and our goal is to get those out there by the July IETF so we can uh, present those and, and discuss those. Um, and you know, the idea, I think, is to uh, just replace the drafts that are up there with uh, drafts that are targeting BBRv2, hoping that that will make it more clear that um, these are sort of replacing the, the uh, earlier drafts. Um, uh, next slide, please. So uh, we did want to mention uh, briefly that we are also continuing uh, another thread of research work that we discussed briefly uh, at the November IETF on a uh, an approach we're calling for now uh, BBR.swift, 
uh, which basically leverages approaches from the SWIFT congestion control algorithm, uh, which was presented at, at CICOM uh, 2020, where the approach basically uses uh, the network round trip time as the primary congestion signal. And there, the, the main motivation is that it gives you, uh, for environments where it's available, it can give you a richer signal with more information about the current degree of queuing along the path, uh, which um, has sort of two advantages. One is that it allows faster reaction if there really are long queues right now. Uh, and then the other is that it allows you to help um, avoid overreaction when the queues may be persistent but might be short, for example. Uh, and you know, there's ongoing work for that, uh, preparing for production testing, uh, doing some lab testing right now is the main focus. Um, as we mentioned at TCPM, part of this uh, research and, and development effort includes um, work to provide timestamp information in the TCP options to um, provide the sort of detailed fine grain and more accurate round trip time uh, measurements that you need for a scheme like this. So there's a link to the, the uh, extensible timestamp draft uh, that we uh, put out last fall. Uh, and ultimately, the goal is to allow this as an optional uh, approach for uh, contexts where uh, the target network round trip time is known, uh, which might be the case, for example, in data centers, um, and also where cases uh, for cases where you know that the other traffic sharing your bottlenecks is using um, an algorithm of this same type. Uh, and this might be the case, for example, if you have separate uh, quality of service queues and you can isolate this traffic to its own queue uh, to avoid interaction with other um, uh, classes of algorithm. And we do ultimately want this to be usable for physical machines and virtual machines, which will take some work to plumb the timestamp information up and down uh, the stack to, to make these timestamps available, but that is kind of the long-term goal. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just in conclusion, wrapping up, uh, you know, we're uh, continuing to work on both BBR v2 and this newer uh, approach, uh, BBR Swift, uh, and we're finishing the rollout for internal TCP traffic for BBR v2. Uh, continuing to iterate on uh, external traffic or public internet uh, performance. Uh, and we are hoping to uh, release an internet draft in July. And as always, we uh, invite uh, feedback or uh, test results, uh, issues, uh, patches, anything like that. Um, and uh, next slide, please. And I think uh, that, that uh, wraps it up. Uh, so if there are any uh, questions. Thank you, Neil. We have a, a, a few minutes for questions. I am going to try a new experiment this time, which is that I will cut off the Q and A at uh, at uh, in in about in just under five minutes. Uh, doesn't matter who's in the line. So I'm not going to cut the mic line, but I'm going to cut off the Q and A. All right, Omar, you're up. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thanks, Neil. Uh, can you share, uh, do you have any data on what kind of end devices the BRV2 is deployed on for the external users? Are those uh, Chromebooks, uh, Androids, uh, or something else? And uh, what interests me the most is how BBRV2 interacts with uh, modern uh, modern cellular networks if you have that uh, if you if you have information to share thank you sure yeah so um, to uh, add some details there so where we're deploying BBRV2 um, in um, for the types of traffic you're talking about is for the google.com and YouTube um, servers that are sending traffic out over the public internet to um, end users. And um, so since this is uh, basically um, talking about all of the um, users using YouTube and google.com or currently just some uh, small percentage of them for testing, uh, this basically should be a cross-section of 
of every kind of device that connects to Google and YouTube. Um, and in, in our experience, of course, that's a pretty diverse set uh, that largely, these days, I think largely um, the, the dominant um, uh, bionic technology is Wi-Fi. Um, but obviously, we do have a lot of cellular users as well. Uh, on the cellular side, I think it's still mostly um, uh, 3G and 4G, although we're starting to see, you know, obviously some 5G uh, trickling in now. Um, and uh, so the, I don't have any numbers to share uh, with you today, um, mainly because this, uh, the public internet aspect is still a, a work in progress. Um, but I, I can share that definitely we do spend a lot of time looking at the performance of uh, both the BRV1 and V2 uh, for users that have cellular or Wi-Fi connectivity, since that is such a, a dominant uh, slice of the traffic for, for Google and YouTube. Excuse me. Does that answer the question? Yes, thanks. Oh, okay. Anna, you're up. Anna, you're up. I don't know if you're unable to get yourself unmuted. And you're out of the queue. All right. Well, I will uh, thank Neil then for his presentation, and I will. Uh, I won't speak for everybody here, but I'll speak for many people that um, were very excited about the the update to the draft. I'm looking forward to reading updates to the draft um, um, to the PBR draft, Neil. And that is now. Oh, give me a second. All right, Gauri, you're up. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. OK, so uh, this short talk is going to look at zero RTT parameters for quick, basically to exchange transport parameters to let you do something different in congestion control. And um, there's a draft. It's at revision seven, and it's with these people on the slide, Nicholas, Emil, Tom, and me. Next slide, please. So this is a draft that tries to deal with paths which are not typical. So we're talking about paths that have something that's different in them. Uh, maybe they're slightly higher in delay. That could be many tens of milliseconds. It could be many seconds. They maybe have a very large bandwidth delay product. They maybe have a um, sub IP layer that is on demand. And therefore, when you resume a connection, you get a different capacity. Or maybe you usually get the same capacity, but sometimes you might get a different one. And these paths are typically also have other optimizations, such as um, asymmetry improvements um, to get their overall efficiency at an acceptable level. If you have paths which are non-typical, then there's two options. Either you dynamically learn that the paths are non-typical, or you have information that lets you customize the protocol stack to make it work. And you can do this to mitigate the effects of delay, the BDP, capacity, asymmetry. Our focus was primarily on satellite paths. And um, that now covers a very wide range of paths. And we focus just on geo in, in the initial work here. Um, but you might see other paths that have similar needs. And I think that's one of the important things I'd like to kind of bring up here is if other people are seeing paths that have other needs, maybe slightly different characteristics, we'd love to talk to you because we'd love to make sure whatever we propose here actually works on across a variety of different paths. Next slide, please. 
The context is to define some transport parameters as extensions to QUIC. And these are shared during the zero RTT phase, basically allowing resumption using additional transport and connection properties discovered from a previous successful connection. And what, this is a lot like TCP control block sharing, but it's also different because it's designed for QUIC. We hope that the information that's provided is useful for optimizing client requests. There are cases where your web browser automatically prioritizes different pieces of information. Maybe for the web client, that's a well-known bit of technology that many vendors have already have in their products. But for other applications such as Dash and probably for VPN applications, et cetera, there will be ways to optimize the way in which the network's used by the clients. Since this is ICCRG, the core thing we're going to talk about is using the information to make a jump in the C wind, the congestion window, so that you, instead of starting a session with a configured large initial window or with a normal small initial window, you choose something which is based on previous history and use that to initialize a safe C wind. And like any other method that's used with TCP, for instance, uh, we'd like this information to be shared across multiple connections. This is not a new proposal, but it's a proposal which we'd like to make concrete for quick. Next slide, please. Um, why is this important? If you have the sort of BDP and uh, delay that you might see in a satellite geo environment, then it might take you many seconds to download something which you could actually send using TCP and in maybe a small number of seconds. So Quick is adding maybe two seconds of extra time in a typical configuration here, simply because there is no PEP involved optimizing the protocol. So maybe we can do much better. And this, this slide shows two methods which could be used to improve performance that we've tried in a spreadsheet analysis using a, a little tool. We have to look at different combinations of parameters. And we see the orange one is a jump to 25% of the last window, and then two rounds of RTT to get to the full size window, and green, a high jump method where we delay it by one RTT. So we make the jump more conservatively. There's a range of options in the orange green area all the way across the blue area where you can trade performance against conservative congestion control behavior. And that's the good reason for presenting this in ICCRG because a lot of the issues are concerned with how best to adapt. But before you adapt, you need a method of having the data about the previous connection. Next slide. And the way in which to have this information, we believe, is to get the server to store parameters in a BDP extension, which we then communicate from the server to the client. The client gets visibility of the information. It may also get an encrypted token. The encrypted token can be returned back to the server, so the server could be stateless if that's the design you want, and simply receive previous information um, about a flow that it had previously struck uh, with the same client. When you come to the second connection to the same server, you can reinitialize the information. And of course, there's a possibility that the path to the endpoint could have changed. And as a point, there's a path change possibility in the amount of capacity that you might have. Of these two, the most dangerous is the change of the path, but um, the method we propose will validate the RTT against the previous RTT, and we're suggesting that we include some form of pacing when we initially start a new um, higher congestion window. And in this way, if there is a big RTT change on the path, then the damage that's created is very much limited uh, and we believe could be made safe for wide-scale deployment and therefore something that might be interesting to standardize. 
Next slide, please. This is a set of metadata we expect to put in the BDP metadata. Um, three parameters, bytes in flight, minimum RTT encountered, which is partly to configure as a safeguard, but also to configure a pacing interval. And uh, one of the initial, one of the problems is, init is initializing the RTT of the pacer. So this information is quite helpful in getting a good response and the maximum packet number encountered. So we say with these three pieces of information, can we now jump safely? Next slide, please. Um, next slide, we don't need to talk about this. Um, well, we've approached this in various ways. Uh, one way uh, was to perform some implementation work in PicoQuick, and um, there's a GitHub that you can use to access this. This is primarily focused on the uh, exchange of the cryptographic information at the start of Quick, of a Quick connection, so that you can actually get the bandwidth uh, parameters exchanged. And it focused on a very simple, easy to implement change to the congestion controller. We have a more advanced version of how we expect that congestion control um, update to occur in the draft. So please look there to find more details about what we actually suggest. But it's clear, even from these three simple results, that without the option, it took 4.3 seconds to exchange the two megabyte chunk of data on average, that's the median value. With the zero RTT enhancement, 3.4, and with the zero RTT BDP, uh, 2.9 seconds. So at least saving what we would see um, as people evaluating satellite links, a significant proportion of the download time. And these are uh, uh, for modern, Satellite links running at 50 megabits per second. Next slide, please. Uh, worth also looking at uh, how the client might use this information because um, the server can always optimize and it'd be nice to optimize in a predictable way so that the user didn't have to be concerned about it. But also there's a possibility to optimize the client if it knew about the likely BDP aspects of the path it's using. And we did some work in 2018, which is published in the NetSat Days um, conference. It looked at Dash, and we showed that using a Dash client, uh, we could take this information as one of the inputs to adapt the results to produce a much more predictable performance. In this case, trying to avoid um, the strange behaviors that happen uh, when your predictor gets the uh, capacity wrong and therefore vastly under underestimates the amount of capacity you've got because you've got a larger RTT. Um, there was talks in the IRTF open about the various ways in which um, dynamic adaptive streaming players can play out. And this is kind of like one of the input parameters and a good example of how um, knowing something at the client can help you actually make better requests at the application layer. Next slide. Uh, this shows a number of different plots all on the same graph. I'm first of all going to talk about the blue plot. This is Reno. And um, the Reno behavior is that the congestion window opens in more or less steps, stepping up each time it gets a round of acts. And for a longer RTT path, this basically controls the amount of capacity you can get. For small to medium sizes of exchange, this is totally the dominant factor rather than the amount of bandwidth available when you use something like Quick because if Quick uses Reno, there is no protocol enhancement along the path. So if we look at the jump scenario, we see here a different case. This is where the congestion controller is initialized with a previous RTT measurement. 
Um, we chose in this case to initialize with 25% of the bandwidth. That's 25% of the previously used capacity. That means the following RTT, there is a step up to use half the capacity and then another step up, etc. until after several RTTs, we've used the whole capacity. Now, it would be possible to jump immediately to use the full capacity, uh, but if you're a congestion control person, that might frighten you um, because it would cause severe congestion against any other flaws that happen to be present at the time when your new flaw started rather than when you previously measured your available capacity. So we decided to initialize to around 25%. Um, again, um, something we're happy to experiment with, and there are ways of um, making this more conservative. We know this. Next slide. A slight variation here. I'm going to talk about the pink and gray curves. The pink curve is a method we called high jump, which delays the, arc, the, the increase. And um, we can talk about more of this in the draft. We also have high jump pace, the gray curve. What I'm trying to say here is that there are a range of congestion control decisions, all of which are um, safe to some extent, but we, we would claim safe enough, and a much better performance than, than Reno. The high jump paste um, paces the packets out at the rate determined by the previous capacity, and we get this more linear growth in the use of the capacity. And we could talk more about that, but I can't because I need to move on. So next slide. We talked about the client being able to use the information. So this is not just a server side decision, which is why we're trying to standardize the format of the transport extension. Next slide. And we've also looked at the security of it, the, the way in which you exchange the, the parameters, the way in which the path cannot modify these parameters are important to us. And we believe that we have a safe mechanism here that works with TLS 1.3. Next. There's some interaction. Um, Emil is our TLS person. Um, and there are probably things that we should discuss between QUIC and TLS to see how this initial exchange of data should best be handled. Um, I think some form of synchronization between the two working groups is important. This isn't a congestion control issue, it's more a security um, discussion, but, it, but it's still an important part of the design of the mechanism. Next slide. Congestion control safety is the thing which probably is most important for this group. And if we can standardize or adopt a way of exchanging this information, we also need to adopt a way of safely using it. Um, we're assuming that any method we use here will have a way of backing out quickly and efficiently as soon as there is loss detected and the CWD has been artificially increased. So um, we, will, we will expect to quickly back out of any problem, but um, do we need a draft on congestion control safety that updates 6928? Maybe this might be something useful uh, to set the boundaries here. Uh, next slide, please. We could use a new BDP extension specified in QUIC, and we are wanting to do that part of the work in QUIC, but there's obviously also a congestion control piece, which is why we're trying to bubble this up here in this group and attract some comments. So trying to stick roughly to time, I'd like to take comments now if possible. Um, very quickly, uh, can you mute your mic there, Goy? So I, I, I don't know that we have time for Q&A. We are already at time. Um, but I'll encourage people to thank you for presenting this here. I want people to engage on this question. And I'll take my, my, my moment to basically say that this is something that we expect 
the the uh, leave us at a specific mechanism, but the idea of recording and reusing congestion control information is something that we expect will happen in quick because there are places to store this information at the client. This is something that is different from TCP, where uh, uh, a server can actually encode this information and ship it off to a client and then use it on uh, the next connection and connection is established, which makes it much more likely that something like this will get deployed by quick implementations. So it is. Uh, much more important now that we actually engage on this topic. ICCRG is the right forum. Perhaps we can continue this discussion on the list and at subsequent, uh, uh, at the next meeting as well. But I'll thank Gauri also for putting this together very quickly at short notice. Do you want to say something, Gauri? Yeah, uh, I'd just like to say that we are, we are super interested in not doing this as a group of satellite engineers who've worked on PEPs and enhancement and modeling of really long delay paths, but to do it within the ITF, where we can get other people involved in this. This is a super interesting place where we can actually collaborate between different people, and we'd really love to get feedback on this. Thank you so much, Gauri, again for the presentation. One quick announcement, Bob just announced that uh, a new draft uh, describing prod condition control has been posted. Please take a look. Uh, we might uh, end up discussing that at the next IDF, at the next ICCRG meeting. Um, uh, thank you again, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the IDF. We'll see you next time.